Justin here. Today we're talking about motif development, which is essentially repeating sections of your solo. Now, if you don't do any repetition, for the listener, it's going to sound like a big, long, rambling tale without a point. You know, when we go to the pub and there's somebody who's had a bit too much to drink and they just talk and it never really makes any sense and it just kind of goes on far too long. Well, that's the guy that doesn't do any repetition or motif development. It just rambles on and on and on now there's a fantastic interview with stevie ray vaughan where he talks about music having to have a thread you don't have to be able to see the thread that but there needs to be a thread there that ties stuff together now sometimes for me the thread is not something that anyone would ever know about so it might not be a, a very obvious uh, melody statement like a repetition it might just be that i'm going to explore bends or i'm going to explore slides or it could be upper chord extensions or any kind of technical stuff but the easiest and the best one to start off with is motif development of taking a small idea and repeating it a lot and seeing what the effect is of the thing that you're repeating over a set chord progression Right. So it doesn't I mean, you can do it over one chord. In fact, Miles Davis was a master of that in his modal period, even though it was just one chord or in a blues circumstance, for example, you can play just that one little idea and repeat it over and over and it can really start to cook up. I think where the chords are changing, it becomes a little bit more interesting. And this is mostly what we're looking at with this major scale kind of playing in the key idea. So. The idea would be that you literally just take a small musical idea and you repeat it around over a bunch of the chords. Often you'll need to change it a little bit. So you'll change either the note it finishes on or where it goes to. Um, I think in the intro I deliberately tried to pick one that I knew would be like a little phrase that would go off in, in different directions. But let's. Uh, I'm just going to use that same loop that I used for the little intro and I'm going to pick... Um, that's going to be my little motif and then I'm going to see what can I do to that motif to make it work over the chord progression so and as far as like where did that one come from well I just I, I know we're in the key of G that's a good note to start off with we're going up the scale down the scale and back so it's like that's not a particularly funky idea it's just should be a simple one for you to be able to see so let's see what happens if we do that <laughs> to be exactly the same all of the time it can go anywhere you want but the idea that i'm continually returning to this little bit makes it feel like it's a a melody like it like it's something that's supposed to be there and it's not just endless rambling so there are lots of different approaches to this motive development and i'd like to take you through some of them and i'd recommend that you have a go of practicing some of these specifically now for me when you're practicing something like this it's gonna go wrong sometimes and that's okay because you're learning. You're not improvising for real. I wouldn't recommend deliberately trying to do this sort of thing on the bandstand, like when you're playing a gig. This is for practice, where you're, where you're trying to deliberately explore an idea and things will go wrong. Like you're trying to learn a skateboard trick or something, you're going to fall off sometimes. And that's okay. 
You don't want to be scared of doing that. And when you're trying to explore a motive, sometimes you'll play the motive and be like, yeah, this is cool. And then over the second goal, you'll be like, oh, that was horrible. But you're learning. At least every time, if something sounds a little bit sour, you recognize it, go, yeah, maybe I need to figure out what to do here. And then you stop and have a think about it or uh, pick a different motive over a different chord or change the last note of the motive. or Try and figure out what it is that went wrong. Now, the first and easiest example for this motive development is playing the same lick three times in a row and then doing something different or just repeating the same thing over and over. You get a lot of stuff, particularly in the blues field, where you just have this one you know, repeating lick going dwerdily, 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 while all of the chords are changing for a whole 12 bar sequence. It sounds incredible. So repetition can be like straight repetition or it can be this like playing it three times and then doing something completely different. Either of those things tends to work pretty well. Another great tool that you've got available for motive development is making a rhythm statement. Probably the most famous of all is Beethoven's fifth, da, 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 which he then develops for a whole symphony. But you've got lots of things in jazz. You've got stuff like Autumn Leaves, where you've got this little melody that gets repeated. The, the, the rhythm of the melody is repeated all the way through the A section. You've got things like We Will Rock You by Queen, do, do, ja, do, do, ja, which is this thing, this memorable thing. Now, when it comes to a guitar line, of course, you can pick any rhythm and you can apply it to any group of notes that you want. So I'd recommend just trying to keep a, a very simple little rhythmic idea and then seeing what you can do, seeing how you can explore it note-wise. Remember, you don't have to stick with it exactly. So you want to have a kind of a, 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 a starting point, a starting statement, rhythm statement. But you might want to develop that and you might find that you end up developing more a a different rhythm statement than exactly the one you started off with, but so long as there's a thread, so long as there's a connection, it's going to work out great. <laughs> Another tool that you've got in your motive development toolbox is the melody statement. Now, particularly if you've got a song that you're learning, using the melody of that song as the foundation for your motive is extremely strong. If you're ever lost on what to play at the start of a solo, find the melody. Learn how to play the melody of the song that you're using and using that as a springboard into your solo is always going to sound strong. Even if you end up like playing essentially the whole melody, you're never going to play it the same as the singer and you want to be adding your own embellishments and stuff. And that is a really super strong way of, of developing an idea. So literally learn the melody of the song that you're playing, learn how to play it, you know, so you're confident with it and then see if you can kind of muck around with it a little bit, you know, go off on a tangent from part of the melody. Don't go all, I wouldn't recommend going like full Mariah Carey on it and trying to embellish every note of it because that just ends up sounding a bit lame, I think, most of the time. So uh, not the way Mariah Carey did. She was an incredible singer, of course, but uh, I think when guitar players tend to do that, if they take a simple melody and then embellish every bit, it just ends up kind of losing the beauty of the main melody. So be respectful of that, I would recommend. But if it's a starting point, a springboard, then just use it to see if it can take your musical imagination in an interesting direction. 
Another tool that I find myself using quite often if I'm lost for melodic ideas is to focus on a particular technique. So either like sliding or finger tapping or doing a string bend or whatever, these kind of ideas, they can be a little bit of a get out of jail free card if you're stuck on, if your musical imagination isn't firing and you don't have a, a strong melodic idea. Just saying like, okay, I'm going to slide all the time. So I'm like, essentially I'm doing my one finger solo practice and I'm going to focus on distance sliding for my solo. That could be the idea. And if that's the case, then you just go like this. <laughs> even more tools that you've got in your melodic development toolbox as well. We've already looked at playing a major scale in thirds. Now, thirds are actually quite a strong melodic idea on their own. So they're something that can tie a solo together quite nicely if you choose to use them and then hold on some different notes to kind of... It doesn't just sound right if you play the scale in thirds straight up and down, right? That doesn't work. But you can use little sections of thirds and each time you're using the thirds, it's enough for the listener to kind of feel like that's the idea that's getting repeated. So it can be a standalone little thing. Let's have a little try. <laughs> in that last example that not only was I using thirds but I was also starting to use a little bit of melodic development and rhythmic development there are lots of these things that get combined together it's not like one or the other they're all lots of little ideas that you want to be aware of practice consciously with the hope that they become something that happens unconsciously now there are two more commonly used melodic development ideas that are primarily used in classical music where things are composed and worked out beforehand it is possible to kind of improvise with them, but I've found it very difficult to kind of make a, a, a true improvised example of this. I can write it down and work it out and then show you that like I made it up on the spot, but that, I don't really feel like that's very fair. The two things I'm talking about are inversion and retrograde. Now, inversion would be if you take a melodic idea and you go down where you went up and up where you went down by the same melodic amount. So if you went up a third, you'd go down a third. If you went up a fourth, you'd go down a fourth, that kind of thing. That would be inverting a melody. And like I said, that's maybe there are cleverer people than me that can improvise and do that on the spot. But I, you know, I wrote it down. I thought, yeah, I'll teach you about that. But actually, I can write it down and do it. And I've done it when I studied classical music and we had to do that kind of stuff. But actually doing it on the guitar in real time and improvising with it isn't something that I'm really capable of. And I don't feel like I should be trying to teach you guys to do stuff that I can't do properly myself. So uh, that's why I have, I'm not going to do a, a demo on that. But the twin of that is this one called retrograde, which is where you play a whole melodic idea completely backwards. So if you're going up in a, on a basic level, if you went retrograde would be now, doing it in a scale like that makes a little bit of sense, but if the line becomes a lot more complicated and you play it up and down, 
it, it it definitely works as an idea. I found, like I said, I found it a lot more difficult to truly improvise while thinking about that. It was something I felt like I had to write down, which kind of took some of the improvisational joy away from it. So it might be something that you want to explore if you want to get into writing some ideas down or if you're using it as a composition tool as opposed to an improvisational one. Now, I just want to circle back to the thing I talked about at the beginning, which was the thread. Now, it really is, I think, a key thing for me. I still remember seeing this video. I think it's Stevie Ray Vaughan and Albert King talking together about improvising. I think that's where it came from. I need to dig it out. But the, the idea of everything that I played in a solo linking to each other with this invisible thread was a real game changer for me. It completely changed how I played all the time. Uh, if I'm playing a jazz solo, rather than it just being one lick and then another lick and then another lick, I was always looking for a way of having something connecting them together. Uh, particularly with blues, it can be very easy if you get into the idea of learning licks to have like this lick and then that lick and then that lick and then that lick. If they don't have a thread, it never seems to work. So for me, it's all about finding the thread, finding the thing that I can connect this lick into this lick into that lick, not consciously. It's not like I think you should think about it too much. It's that you want to try and get to the point where you practiced it enough that it just happens on its own, to be aware of it, to allow it to happen when it starts happening and kind of actively encourage it, if you like. Because I think some of these things are they're more difficult when you're actually really trying to get to it. You need to be aware of what it is and then kind of put yourself in a place where you can allow it to happen. And that's it's something that I find increasingly frustrating is trying to teach that is hard uh, a good analogy if any of you are into it is meditating if you if you meditate and you try to get yourself really calm the more you try the harder it is to get there you just have to get to a point where you can just totally allow everything to just fall away to find that empty space and I think it's a little bit like that with music is trying to find to practice it enough beforehand that when it comes to improvising you just let it go and find that you know, I don't know. It, we're getting into pretty sticky territory now. I know uh, Keith Richards thinks all of this music stuff lives in the air and that you're just like a conduit, an aerial that can pick up this stuff and that, that you're just expressing it. I mean, I don't really know. I don't think anybody really knows where it all comes from. But what I'm trying to give you are the tools that will give you the best chance of, of connecting with this musicality, uh, having good ideas in your musical imagination to... Uh, let out when that conduit happens uh, and I've there's no definitely no substitute for practice so the more you practice the luckier you're going to get the better things are going to get the easier everything's going to feel so that is the the main key thing from all of this stuff is practicing these ideas these concepts that I'm giving you with the hope that they'll just start to happen naturally on their own pretty soon so let's talk about the unit four practice schedule. It's 10 minutes again, two five minute slots. The first slot, you want to be working on your major scale in thirds. So really focusing on pattern one, first of all, making sure you get that real comfortable, real natural, easy under the finger. So you don't have to think about it too much. Improvise with it, really explore it as much as you can. When you feel happy with pattern one, then move on to pattern two. When you get to pattern two, spend a little bit of time really zoning in on the fingering choices that you want to make. Because it does get a little bit stickier. There are benefits to using lots of different fingerings if you want to be uh, heading in that way so that no matter what finger you end up on, you're able to, to do the thirds comfortably. There's also advantages to having a set fingering that you stick to all of the time. Both those things work. It depends on your personality type and what sort of things that you're going to play and how you're going to play it and what sort of improvising you're doing or whether it's composition. So many different variables there. You ex want to explore the ones that you feel most hip with. Um, once you're hip with pattern two, then alternating between patterns one and pattern two within the pra same practice schedule is fine. The second part of your practice schedule will be motive development. So still improvising, but really trying to explore this idea of developing a melody. Using any of the tools that we talked about today, in anything at all, so long as you're developing an idea. And I would really try and spend some time consciously doing that, looking for little starting points that you can use. Um, I don't really have that many of them, but I know there's a, a video of Larry Carton where he talks about having these little 
opening phrases that he might use to develop a solo so that he's got if he's not feeling inspired on a particular day he'll grab out one of those standard phrases which i mean his standard phrases are probably better than my best phrases on my best ever day but he's got these kind of stock things that he can use as a springboard into a solo so it might be worth trying to think about that a little bit trying to find a little idea that that feels real hip for you that you're confident that you can develop if you've developed it a few times you'll probably be better at developing it so that might help you on your way with it as well for all of the practice that you're doing now i'd recommend that you start in the key of g that is our home key where it's our safe zone where we're going to learn new things as soon as you're feeling confident in the key of g i would recommend you move to the key of c and there are two home keys uh, the reason i've chosen those like key of g has a dot at the third fret c has no dot on the eighth fret so they look visually a little different it's not going to draw you too much to just playing on the dots like if you were learning only in the key of g and a and b for example so g and c are a good start when I used to teach this course, when it was called Master the Major Scale, I taught it only in the key of G. And I kind of regret that now because I got the feedback I got from students was like, yeah, great, I can play in G, but in any other key, it's a nightmare. Uh, and so I kind of went like, yeah, I need to change that. And that's one of the reasons why I'm doing this course, apart from the hopefully obvious visual and audio upgrade. But I would definitely recommend having a go at some other keys now. Uh, the key of A would be a good choice. Key of F would be a good choice. Uh, if you've got backing tracks from my jam, uh, my jam series, Jam Major, backing tracks they would be great uh, if you can use a looper pedal to make your own backing tracks and you can figure out the chords in the key that is great the best thing of all is if you've got a jam buddy if you've got somebody that you can jam with so they're playing the rhythm in one key and you're you know playing the lead and then you swap over that is by far the best way to practice this stuff so really you know we're coming out of lockdown right now so get out there find some jam buddies and practice your improvising with another human it'll make you loads better for it the musical communication with another person and the sharing of ideas and being able to problem solve together Together, it really really is a massively big deal if you can find somebody to jam with but failing that backing tracks will be fine or a looper pedal I really hope you enjoy this practice session of course on the website really love to see some examples of you guys doing this stuff so record a video of yourself stick it up on YouTube and leave me a link over on the website and I'll do my best to go and check it out if you happen to be on YouTube really appreciate you slapping the like button and giving me a subscribe and let me know in the comments how you're getting on with the course if you've got any particular struggles I'm trying to check it out the guitar guides as well are over looking at all the comments and trying to feedback to me stuff that I need to know about as well so we got your back we're trying to help you learn and be the best that you can be really Really appreciate your support as always hope you're enjoying the course so far and i'll see you for plenty more very soon you'll take care of yourselves bye bye